tonight we have a writer director who won awards for his excellent work and we are happy to have him tonight welcome mark weber hello That's hey. All hey everybody mark your movie is so touching and so powerful and so unusual and we want to ask you a lot of questions about it but first i want to ask you please tell us about how you started the business especially coming from that humble beginning very humble beginnings of yours um well thank you first of all i'm really happy to be here um so thanks for having me and i started in the business well first i grew up extremely impoverished uh and i was homeless for a few years with my mom who was a single teenage mom had me when she was 16 years old and so when i first started to see movies as a young boy they took me someplace else and i started to develop this uh fascination with movies and actors and this deep strong desire of wanting to be an actor myself um because it seemed like the ultimate life to have um and so to to kind of skip through that crazy uh history i ended up getting into performing arts high school in philadelphia um that i went to for a few years ended up leaving early um in my junior year and uh, linked up with a local casting director in philadelphia who happened to be casting an independent film i was 17 years old uh and i auditioned for it and i i booked the part and that got me a meeting with a casting director in new york which got me a meeting with an agent in new york and uh the rest the rest is history so i was really floored and we'll get to your movie believe me but i was like floored to read that your mother was um became a vice president of the green movement and what was her journey to success you well know? you know and what I, was that tv movie that they did about the two of you when you were homeless yeah so when my when i became homeless with my mom my mom became really heavily politically active and started organizing other poor women and children who were on the streets and became like a straight up radical revolutionary and as a way of survival at first initially you know to look after her and i um and to empower uh, ourselves and that began her her pretty i mean she still is a huge political activist she still lives in north philadelphia um in a really tough neighborhood that i grew up in with my mom and i don't i don't even know if she would define it as success really either you know it's it's more just a means of uh it, it's a strong calling for her um she's one of the most selfless people that i know and she's still act you know in a community where she's surrounded by poor and homeless people all the time and she just has this really uh beautiful desire to constantly want to help them amazing so and that's why you kind of have your movies have a spirit of independent movie uh you unique also because in all your movies you cast your family and not that other directors have not cast their girlfriend their wife and their little children in tiny role but you have like what your three year old co-star with you and by the way he outshines you i'm sorry right. to say no no that, please i know he, i know he does is, <laughs> that kid is unbelievable how did you direct him well you know i first of all i i started this process that i've like self 
defined called reality cinema in like 2012. I made a, a film called The End of Love with my son Isaac when he was two. He's 12 now. Wow. And, and then I did a film called Flesh and Blood that I made with my real mother and my brother and sees me reuniting with my biological father for the first time in real time who I hadn't seen in 30 years since I was a five-year-old little boy. And then so with this, with The Place of No Words, I felt uh, so ready and excited to right. go and, and make another film with my young son, Bodie. And so in so many ways, having gone through this process and working with the same close, tight-knit group of collaborators, yeah, I knew that I would be able to pull it off and right. create the environment that would be just amazing for Bodhi to fully be able to explore and feel safe and, and allow us to dig deep. And I think also I benefit greatly from being in my films. I know some people think, well, if you're, if you're a writer and director, it must be really hard to be in your film. But for me, in some ways it makes it easier because I'm just constantly a guide and I know what we need. And so if you're my scene partner and we're doing a scene, I just kind of in the back of my mind know I'm help I'm helping guide us and know what we need. So in a way I'm able to right. move on quicker and pivot and adapt and, and really, yes. you know. Yes. So did you feed him line by line? Is that how it works? Because I don't know how his three-year-old can actually say all that stuff. Yeah, well, you know, he we would rehearse, we would go over our lines and then also <laughs> some of the scenes we would shoot as improv essentially too yeah. there, there there's moments that are kind of continuous free-flowing takes of spontaneity but they're anchored by the the framing of of the scene and the context that we're heading into the scene with so in a way whatever Bodhi would say within the context that 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 framework would be right because he's right. he's anchored and he's plugged in within the context of the story so it allows for these moments that feel so authentic and so real which is you know what I what I really strive for but he knew you're not really dying hopefully <laughs> Yes, no, he, he did, he did know that. Point, yeah. Maybe he thought at the beginning, maybe he, anyway. Oh, no. I'm, I mean, the thing that actually makes it the most difficult making a film like this is that I can never stop being a dad. So I, I constantly have my, my, my dad hat on at all times and yeah. his emotional well-being and his safety is, is, so is the top priority for me. So it's really interesting. It takes a lot of, there's, there's moments in the film that I know feel really uh, potent, but they take a lot of kind of movie magic to make those things feel as if they yeah. are way more intense than they really are. Okay, so you're a good director. I try to be. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, you go, you go um, from realism, you know, scenes, they're very realistic, they're picking up their car, they, you know, they have family picnic, they hang around, there's a family, very loving family, and, um, and then you go into a whole fantastical world willow or something you know mm -hmm. it's ingmar bergman <laughs> <It's willow. laughs> so so um what were you thinking in in crafting that movie that that fantastical journey will teach your son something is that yeah yeah i i so much of what I wanted the film to be. Well, I wanted, I wanted the fantasy to also feel like reality. And I wanted our reality to almost feel like fantasy. I, I really wanted to blur the lines between yeah. the two. Um, almost explore like a waking 
like a walking dreamlike state. Um, And also just that would attempt to honor the way I see my child's mind working and um, and so much of the fantasy elements in the film come directly from the stories that Bodhi and I would tell each other. I see. Um, and so much of, you know, at night when I sit down and I make up a story to tell the kids, I'm improv and I'm, I'm thinking of a, a silly story, right. but that also is grounded in some aspect of their reality and delivers some type of moral and message. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, that I think, and that's, that's part, part of what the film is attempting to, to do. I want to um, move to the student questions because it's for them, really, because I can talk to you for hours about this one. <laughs> but, <laughs> so let's, uh, Mike, can we open up to the students and see if we have a question or questions? Absolutely. They're all very uh, shy at the beginning, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we do have a question here from Dulce Sosa from our LA campus. Dulce, we've enabled you to unmute yourself. What is your question for Mark? Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, well, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, so my question is, what was the most challenging scene to film and why? Well, I, you know, this whole movie was so challenging to film. Um, I think partly because of what I was just talking about where I, I just never stopped being a dad. And so I, I didn't ever really want to push Bodhi too far. And we would work in these short bursts of time. So sometimes like our whole shooting day would only be like an hour because that's all really Bodhi could handle. And then to top it off, we were in some really remote, challenging locations to get to with not a lot of folks, not a big crew. You know, there's just about four or five of us. So kind of getting up those mountainsides and deep into those forests were were really difficult with with my little guys. So um, the by the time the film was done, it was, uh, a big, a big sigh of relief because it was, it was very difficult to to pull off. Yeah. Great. Um, we have a, a question here from our LA campus. Um, how did this idea of casting your family come about? Was it out of necessity? Yeah, I, you know, not nece- not necessity, but it was uh, my first film that I made with uh, my family, The End of Love, with my son Isaac, I had just recently become a, a, a brand new father. And I, I knew I wanted to make a film about parenting and about a single dad in a way that I hadn't seen before. So um, that's where it really started. And then, you know, after I finished The End of Love and uh, I took that film to Sundance and had a really great year up there. I felt like I really found my voice as a an artist and a director. And I wanted to continue exploring working in that way. Also because I'm, I'm particularly fascinated with realism and authenticity in, in, in my acting and in films. And so I set off uh, attempting to do it again. And now I've, I've done it. Um, two other times and I, uh, I love it. It's deeply fulfilling when you work with the people that you love, you know, when you get to make works of art with your children and your wife and your mom and your dad um, in this way, it's, it's a deeply fulfilling process for me. I Thank wanted, you. yeah. Go ahead, Tova. No, I wanted to ask you because I'm still fascinated before I forget this question. Um, At the end of the movie, it's like you say, it's like the biggest accomplishment really. 
what I understood that the whole point of that journey was to make sure that your son is not afraid anymore. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah that's it. And um, how, how did you make him not afraid anymore? I see that at the end, he takes his own path mm -hmm. from the mountain. You're not really holding his hand, he's taking his own path. Mm -hmm. It means he's not afraid anymore. You know he's gonna be okay if he can go back. Um, the other thing I see that he also had a little more cuddling and stuff with his mother instead of like a lot with you. Mm -hmm. And, but, and then you tell him that you will go to heaven. But still, what is the point that you think that he stopped being afraid and that he was free? Yeah, I, well, I'm not sure if he's totally free of fear. I guess the idea was, is that I wanted to arm him with the tools to, to tap into his own sense of freedom, being free of fear, free of worry. Um, but knowing still it's fear is going to come up. Things are going to continue to happen. And essentially that's what life is. Um, and so I wanted it to be, I wanted it to be a bit of both. I think that's why I chose to end the film kind of again back in the fantasy realm where I come to him and it's just this long shot almost as a as a way of saying that Bodhi can always still bring me up in his mind again. Um, right. so I'll kinda, always be with you. I'll always be with you. Yeah, I'll always be with you. And but I think, you know, so much of the film for me is, is addressing, is addressing fear and, and the ways in which we, through the stories that we tell each other, um, our belief systems, you know, the faith that we make up and choose to believe are the things that provide us with uh, a temporary sense of relief, you know, but I think that for me personally, I'm always constantly redefining what freedom really even is anymore. Um, and in some ways, I think uh, I think know, no I, Instagram is a freedom. Instagram? No Instagram is. Oh no! Ins yeah, <laughs> I know I, that. It's if these are the simple little things. If you could spend a day, you know. <laughs> <laughs> not on Twitter and not on Instagram. I'm like, whoo, I'm free. <laughs> it, it's so true, Tova. I mean, uh, that is definitely um, part of, of, of my uh, trying to cultivate freedom <laughs> in my own personal life is just putting, putting the device down for, a, you know, a few hours in the day and getting present and looking up at what is right before me as opposed to thinking about what do I have to do later or worried about what I did yesterday. How did that idea come about, about you know, the father having uh, you know, an incurable disease where he's gonna die and the journey that he takes with his boy? And how did that come about? Well, a couple things. Most One, of your stuff is personal and here you are. Yeah. Well, my, well, two things. Well, one overall in general, I mean, I'm at the age now where I've lost, you know, quite a few people in my life. Yeah. Um, and, and, and so, you know, as, as you get older, you, that starts to happen with more frequency. You, um, you know, when you have children as well too, you, I, became intensely aware of my own mortality. Um, so these are just things that I, on a personal level, grappling with, but also on my last film, Flesh and Blood, uh, 
where I reunite with my father, my, my dad is actually really terminally ill. So he has stage four non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And so that's still very much something, yeah. you know, my, my personal story. And yeah. so um, it always spills over into, into the things that I make. Okay. I, uh, I know that Katie has a question, but uh, I just want to ask one question very quickly. So, because I'm very fascinated, and I think the student would be fascinated about the fact that you have that realistic style and it's very unique. Does that allow you, because you acting, your wife is acting, your son, your father, you know, your mother, to be able to finance a movie a little easier or it has it's just as hard <laughs> it's just, i mean it's easier for me in the sense that i don't uh i don't make my movies for any barely any I'm barely any money so my films are all what would be considered low budget films or small budget films, um, but I, I wouldn't want to make my films any other way in these ones, you know, when they are, when I'm striving for, for this level of, of realness that I'm going for, um, more crew, more stuff, more money doesn't, isn't conducive with, yeah. you know, creating that environment. But um, I will say though, with, you know, this being my fifth feature film, that it is a bit easier in the sense that I'm I'm not a first time director anymore. I have a body of work. I have, you know, um, people who believe in my work and who watch my work. So in that way, getting this film financed was a bit easier because I have a proven track record. But you know, independent film in general is a very challenging space yeah. independent artists in general you know no but the way you're doing movie is um is another way of tackling the independent movie landscape yeah mike do we have a question we do we um we do have a question from katie um katie we've enabled you to unmute yourself what is your question for mark hi thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us tonight um I wanted to ask, so I was reading in the New York Times that you did your own editing for this film. And in addition to acting and directing and writing it, I wanted to know if you ever felt like you were too close to the project. And if so, how did you kind of work around that? Um, yeah, no, I, I, I always build in a lot of time for post. So, Whenever we're done shooting, I take, you know, two months at least before I don't jump straight into editing or watching dailies. Uh, I like to create as much of a gap in between the production and the editing process so that I can really, really be kind of free of anything that I was chasing on set and allow myself to really see what things became and how the film evolved and, and grew. Um, so I don't know, I've all, and I've also had like a very weird ability, I think because of starting off as an actor and being really used to watching myself and stuff that I, I have an odd knack for being able to, um, watch my work as if it's not me, um, which, and I, and I'm just, I'm never, I don't know, I'm never really interested in vanity. I don't, I've, I, I like vulnerability. I like rawness. I like realism. Um, I like, I like being vulnerable. Um, and so in a way, I think that provides it acts as a bit of a buffer for me where I don't get pulled um, by footage or moments in a way that is chasing a sense of, of vanity. So, um, I feel, I feel, I've always felt pretty, pretty safe in creating that, that distance that I need. Thank, thank you. you so much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we do have a question here from Milad El Dumani uh, from our LA campus. 
We've enabled you to unmute yourself. What is your question for Mark? Hi, Mark. Um, I just wanted to say that The Place in the Words is a beautiful and emotionally rich movie for me. And I was wondering if you could tell me or us, uh, what's your process when you came up with this movie? Like, uh, what are the major milestones you went through? Oh, well, thank you. I'm glad that the film connected with you. And the process the process for me is, is um, you know, I, I get whenever I get struck with an idea to, to write um, or an idea for a film, it usually comes in these stream of consciousness ways. I'm inspired by just the people around me, the world around me, um, my dreams. Uh, I'll be driving in the car, listening to some music and suddenly I have an idea for a piece of dialogue or a camera move. Um, and so, so often for me, the writing process is kind of like, I don't know, attuning to a certain type of frequency and opening up in a certain way. And these ideas just start coming to me and I start jotting them down in a notebook. And then I start to make connections and I start to see, oh, all right, well, there's, there is something to these things that I've been pondering. Um, and I'm often in a, in a kind of an existential <laughs> state of like, what, is, what does this all mean? Why are we here? So, so much of my work and my process is, is working, working that out for myself, attempting to provide um, questions and answers to, to um, life in, in so many ways. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a question here from our LA campus. Um, the question is, what directors influenced you in making this movie in particular? You know, I I'm not that I'm not that type of director. I I'm um, I, I I often go periods of time where I don't watch much. Um, you know, I have movies that I've been moved through throughout my life, but I, I don't ever, I've never been the type of um, filmmaker who watches other people's work and, and draws direct inspiration from it in a way that I try to emulate. I'm sure I do subconsciously. Um, I love, I love some of the comparisons that I get. I mean, I, I love, uh, you know, Cassavetes and and um, I've been getting some, some Malik uh, comparisons. And I mean, those are, they're incredible filmmakers that to be mentioned in the same class as them is, is really cool, you know? Thank you for that. Um, I do see we have another question here from uh, Katie. Katie, we've unmuted you. What is your question for Mark? Mark, uh, me again. I just wanted to ask, you've been an actor for a long time and I know simultaneously you've also been directing, but when did you decide, okay, hey, I can go behind the screen and inside the director's chair um, and, and make my own movie? When did you decide that and what was kind of going through your mind? Um, I made my, well, I made my first film in, I think it was 2007 um, called Explicit Ills. And I just come off like a string of working with like visionary after visionary and um, just being deeply inspired with working with writer directors um, and actor writer directors. And, you know, when you, when you make a film and you're on set and you, and you, learn how it works um a lot of actors i know I, I start flirting with the idea of of making a film um because i feel like you know if you are an actor or you're interested in the arts and filmmaking um as an actor I, I i see it i see it starting to happen and and other actors and friends that i have who have this desire to want to start to direct. Um, 
and I just so happened, I think it was just the, the string of people that I had, was working with in like the Who early... are they? Who are they? Oh, well, you know. Um, you said visionary I worked with. Yeah, yeah. So, well, Jarmusch and, and Todd Salons. Um, I see. Lars von Trier, Thomas Vinterberg. Um, they were also, those guys were deeply inspiring to me too, just because they created like this self-defined yes. dogma, you know, filmmaking. Yeah. And, and so, and, and my, you know, kind of coming up with this self-defined way of making a film called reality cinema is, is inspired by how different directors throughout the ages have kind of defined this way of working. Um, so those, the string of those those folks and and Ethan Hawke too you know uh Ethan I love Ethan so much and Ethan was the first time that I'd worked with an actor writer director um and a, I actually I was in Ethan's first two films that he directed um his first film Chelsea Walls uh that we shot at the Chelsea Hotel there in New York yeah uh, um with my friend Rosario Dawson. And then, and then I was in Ethan's film, The Hottest State, where I, I was actually playing almost like a version of, of Ethan. And <laughs> he was just amazing to work with. He was so deeply inspiring, so kind and thoughtful and just cool. And, and I really loved that film that we made together. And so that definitely gave me inspiration to, to know that I could pull this off, you know? It's, you know, some of those directors are not really working that much anymore. Todd Solans is not, has not made a movie for a long time. Jarmusch, yeah. the last movie he did with Adam Driver, it was like an amazing movie. Uh, Patterson, I don't yeah. know if you saw it. it was yeah, so, I did. He had Adam Driver on here. Oh, and cool. He showed that movie, yeah. And we talked about it. And that's also, it's like a movie where you think nothing happens and then something happened that even moved you for the next day yeah you know yeah. i love and i love i love work like that yeah yeah because f uh, with your movie too it's like the whole relationship between you and your son and that much love i was like saying to myself i i wish i had that in my life but mm -hmm. i mean <laughs> maybe when you have so much of it at a certain point you have to lose it because it's just not possible to have so much love Mm. So that was like uh, absolutely amazing. So are you still going to work as an actor? I am. I am. I will. You know, I definitely have created a situation for myself where I, the way that I make films is my ultimate environment. And so I've, <laughs> I've like, I've made it difficult for myself to, I, I guess they're just the typical traditional ways of making a movie more, more just having to do with, uh, you know, weird hierarchical elements of how movies are made that like are just don't jive with my spirit. Um, so that is a little hard for me. Um, whenever, uh, something and, I, and I've avoided it my whole life. I've avoided it in my whole career. I've avoided films or sh TV shows that are product. Um, and, and so I will continue to work as an actor. I, I just, am, I really, you, you don't have to, it can be your first film. It's just, I want someone who has a point of view and something, it's striving to do something that's culturally impactful. You know, um, I, I I don't, I don't think I can ever really uh, act anymore just to, to be on a show or something uh, <laughs> at this point. <laughs> yeah. Well, you got four kids. Yeah. I know. <laughs> well, you know, but I know this is something me and my wife talk about all the time. Thankfully, my wife is really um, uh, financially successful right now. She's on a show. <laughs> Which show? Oh. Which uh, show? She's on a show called A Discovery of Witches. It's a Sky uh, AMC show. Um, it, it came out a couple years ago. They're they're shooting their third season right now. Uh, oh, wow. Only the only the first season's aired. So yeah, she's 
she's she's the breadwinner of the family, which allows me to continue to to do things in the way that I want to do. But I I also have been hoping that, um, you know, maybe I I know that I've been kind of in this long journey of hopefully people catch up and find my work and and maybe it'll be even easier to make my next film and maybe you know I'll get a, a bit more resources um to do it yeah and maybe you'll hire real actors no <laughs> <laughs> well <laughs> just okay. no I really liked your wife too I thought she is also very real and very natural and you know that you don't see the effort or anything like that and I think she's a very very good actress um what's happening back with the student today is a very difficult day because everybody's watching the debate oh yeah no, i know that's right so, thank you for anyone being here right now it's cool yeah so um that is the question uh mike yeah we do have a question here from roberto uh roberto we've enabled you to unmute yourself what is your question for mark um wow mark thanks for being here and but a little I got to observe and listen to you and the vocabulary you use. I get to understand that you're a very, very highly conscious person and I love that. And to know that in this industry, there are people like this, because as you said, there's a, it's a business in the background. On one side, this is our passion and art. And yet somehow, there's a lot of superficiality and to see uh, firsthand that there are people in the industry like this and far from it and highly conscious is very inspiring and motivating. And my question is, how did you stay true to yourself and to your vision in an industry which is mainly led not out of passion, but out of business? Oh, uh, well, Roberto, thank you, man. I appreciate that. Uh, Mark, can I just ask you to move a little bit to the light? You yeah, I know I'm getting dark. The light, I know. Here we go. Getting, I'm, but trying to do that subtly. <laughs> <laughs> um, Roberto, well, first of all, um, thank you for that reflection back, um, because it is something that I really. Uh, it means a lot to me, um, and. I think definitely I have been benefited by the way that I was raised. I think coming from growing up as a poor homeless kid on the streets, um, not having anything and being still connected to a group of people in a community um, and my mom who are still in the thick of things and are dealing with people um, who are suffering and struggling um, on a financial level and are just finding it hard to even feed and clothe the people that they love. So these things are the things that I care about most in my life and making art for me, I'm, I know how grateful I am to be in this position and it's easier for me to avoid all the trappings of Hollywood or the industry um, because I know how vapid and shallow and how uh, unfulfilling those things are. And I've also have been able to bear witness to many people who have gotten caught up in the wrong side of the industry and who are maybe chasing fame or resources um, to just make a name for themselves, um, to have more stuff. And I know that that isn't a fulfilling life path. And so, uh, it's just, a you know, integrity and this, this internal sense of honor and a commitment and a responsive, a sense of responsibility that I feel as an artist are easy to maintain because, I have experienced another side of life where, um, you know, I know that fame and money are meaningless. Um, and I think that what means the most to me is, is making art and telling stories and attempting to connect with, with folks like yourself. 
<laughs> Beautiful. Roberto sounds like a wonderful person too. Yeah. Good luck, Roberto. <laughs> mm -hmm. We do have another question in here from uh, our New York campus asking what inspired you to make the imaginary setting in the place of no words uh, set in Viking times? Um, I think, I don't know. I just always kind of thought, hey, it'd be pretty cool to, to play a Viking <laughs> or to try to look like a Viking. I also was like, I can look like a Viking. Um, and also because castles and fairies and uh, goblins and trolls and creatures and things like that are just in all the stories that I, me and my kids tell each other. So it just seemed like, you know, the quintessential ultimate fantasy realm um, were knights and Vikings for me. So it's like a dramatic Princess Bride. Yeah, I love that movie. <laughs> that movie's so good. I love that movie. Well, Tova, I know that you have um, a few um, a few questions for Mark before we wrap up. Um, Mark, there is a question that did just come in uh, just about uh, this film and and stating that. Uh, at a time such as now, your film is such a breath of fresh air and is asking when it will be available to the public. Well, that's cool. Um, it's available tomorrow, uh, the 23rd, Friday the 23rd, all the ways in which you can stream things nowadays. Uh, where, where is it gonna stream on? It's, uh, it's on, well, it's on Apple right now, Apple TV, Amazon, Vimeo, um, cable on demand. Uh, yeah, so if you have cable, you can watch it from your cable box um, or Apple or Amazon. Um, so let me ask you, so in terms of distribution of this movie, so you make this movie with, you know, whatever little money there is, but you finish it and you do it. What was the next process about how to sell it? And did you had the producer rep and did it go directly to all the um, different cable companies, different streaming company and sold them one by one? Was he looking for like one umbrella? You know, I don't think it's a Netflix movie, but let's just say that they just go to Netflix Mm -hmm. and say buy all the rights or mm -hmm. you know or you try that and then if it doesn't work then you just go and make separate deals yeah um, you can't you on can. demand basically it's on demand right yeah well for yeah so for us the journey with this is is that um you know festivals are always they're they're the bedrock of my entire career so sundance south by southwest and tribeca have been amazing for me and i have written and directed and starred in a film that i has played in narrative competition at each of those festivals um out of the five movies that i've made so i have really great relationships there and a great presence there so when i was done with the edit of this film um you know was lucky to premiere at Tribeca in 2019 before all this stuff hit and um, and then took it on a bit of a world tour to festivals around the world, to Munich, to Italy, um, got some great cr critical acclaim and an award and used that um, bit of buzz and good press to secure a distribution deal. So our distributor Gravitas um, handles all you know all our north american rights and they they get the film programmed on cable on demand and amazon prime and apple and you know it's been up for a pre-order for the last few weeks and um and i've just been you know doing we have a really strong kind of social media push and um a lot of good buzz and anticipation for the film and um and just you know, I started social media really as a way to engage with the 
the base of people who support my work. Um, and it's been, it's been really, it's, it's been a beautiful exchange. It's been one that feels really real. And, you know, it, it means so much also doing things like this, where you, you know, you share your film and you can talk with people and have a dialogue and hear what they thought. And, um, so yeah, that, that's, that's been the journey. Well, we definitely loved your movie. We're going to blog about it. We're going to put the interview you. on on YouTube channel. We're going to give it some push in social media. It's a very, very special movie. Thank you. And very touching. As somebody said, very emotional. Um, and and I think that um, it would have kind of a life you know, that is not just for the moment. It's something that can stay there. And uh, we are very, very uh, grateful that you came here and um, to engage with us. And I think that you presented um, an alternative way for people to do movies because everybody's waiting for something big to happen to them mm -hmm. and they don't know you can start the something big yourself in a small way until it, it builds to something big and i think that that's a very good lesson to students more than anything and so that's why i thank you so much i think we learned from you um you know, just because, so um, we wish you success Thank and you. we will try and help you in this journey. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. I appreciate it. This has been lovely. Thank you. Thank you so much. We enjoyed it very much and we learned something. <laughs>